good morning. Thank you so much for that uh, warm welcome. And while you're at it, if you'll do me a favor and stop by the book table and give the same uh, warm welcome to my partner, Pat Lindsay, who does all the Skeptic Magazine covers, which you'll see here in a moment, and uh, does all the typography and design and layout. And Daniel Loxton, who is our junior skeptic uh, editor and illustrator and the author of uh, several books on evolution for kids. So say hi to Daniel when you're back there. And, uh, and, and then uh, we invite you to join the Skeptic Society and subscribe to Skeptic Magazine. You get the, uh, uh, the quarterly publication every three months. It's funny how that works. And uh, in addition to that, you get the uh, decoder ring and uh, the launch codes for the Da Vinci Code and, uh, and the num names of the Illuminati, which are all important. Uh, we do have a lecture series at Caltech that many of you know about. If you're in the Southern California area, we have a good lineup coming up in the fall. I've got uh, Lisa Randall coming from Harvard on October 9th, Steve Pinker also from Harvard on uh, October 23rd, and a whole bunch of other really good speakers, including Beck Stenger, who's here, uh, who'll also be speaking for us with his new book. So, uh, do we have uh, slides yet, sir? Maybe not, okay, oh, here we go. So, oh, are they up? Oh yeah, they're up, okay, good, I can see that now, sorry. Didn't see it back here. Uh, so, um, some of you asked about, quite a few of you asked about the Colbert Report and what that's all about. So, I thought I'd just tell you the story so I don't have to retell the story 200 more times today. <laughs> and just tell you a little bit of, about what it's like to do that kind of show. Is he always in character? Yes, he's always in character. <laughs> Even for the obligatory author shot at the end when he's blasting out the door to go home. Uh, he still stays in character. It's filmed in New York. It's right near where the Jon Stewart show is filmed. Uh, you can only do one of the two shows. They have the same bookers who talk to each other, and they never double book their guests, so you have to do one or the other. They're both good. They're both the best shows, except for maybe Oprah. Uh, in terms of uh, op for authors, that's why publishers always want to try to get their authors on these shows. The, the Obama bump, I mean, not the Obama bump, the <laughs> Colbert bump, but the Obama bump at Occidental College where I used to teach. Anyway, so... Um, uh, it's real. My book was uh, at like 478 just before I went on the show, and it was on Amazon. And it was at number 19 overall nationally for all books within six hours of doing the show. So it's real. And I checked this morning, and it was at like 63, still top 100, uh, several, you know, five days later. So that, that is pretty amazing. According to my publicist, it doesn't matter if you do uh, Larry King or Piers Morgan or or Bill Maurer, none of those shows have any effect at all on book sales. So for some reason, Colbert and Stewart are the two hottest uh, ticket items. And there's more viewers of Colbert than Leno in 18 to 35 age group. So that's, that's how those shows work. They fly into New York, and, uh, and then they take you over there about four hours in advance. The publisher does a, um, the producer does like a pre-interview days before. And amazingly, I think she actually read my book. They almost never read your book. They, they just go by the press release. And, but she did. She had a bunch of questions that led me to believe she actually read it, so I was impressed with that. Uh, of course, that's all irrelevant. That's not really part of the show. Uh, and then, like the hour before you go on, she came in with a, a list of about 20 different funny lines he might use uh, with me, like the, the one about Jesus misses you, because uh, I used to be a believer. So that was one of like 20 different lines. I think he used two or three of the lines. Uh, there's 85 people work on that show for one guy for 22 minutes out of the 30 minutes of actual produced show. He has 15 full-time comedy writers versus me, and I'm not even that funny. And, uh, and so that's why they tell you the first thing, and they tell you this like six times, don't be funny. Don't try to tell jokes. That's Stephen's job. Leave that to the professionals. And uh, <laughs> I do actually think that's a good idea because uh, uh, that's why, well, of course, Colbert, is, he's actually a really funny guy, and he's super fast, very smart, obviously, quick, facile at the jokes. Uh, on, the, on the spur, but if you have 15 full-time writers refining every bit all day long, what we actually see on the air is really the funniest stuff. That's, that's one reason why these shows are so good. Anyway, that's a little bit about that. Um, so I want to talk about The Believing Brain, uh, the new book. I'll just give you just a the quick rundown, the Reader's Digest condensed version of it. So I start off with a, um, basically in my first book, Why People Believe Weird Things, uh, this is sort of the, the, the bookend of that, um, ten books later, nine books later. Uh, that is, I'm interested in not just why people believe weird things, but why people believe anything at all. And in this sense, the uh, weird things are a subset 
of things. You have to believe things, so we end up believing weird things because we're not good at discriminating between true things and weird things or non-things non or false things or whatever. So my thought experiment is imagine you're a hominid on the plains of Africa three and a half million years ago and your name is Lucy. Thank you, some people get that. A lot of people in the Midwest don't get that. <laughs> Lucy, who's Lucy? You know, the little hominid, three and a half feet tall. Anyway, um, and, uh, and I'm, I'm reminded of the uh, Gary Larson cartoon of the Australopithecines in the cave party and the guy's going, you're not the Lucy. <laughs> <laughs> hominid on the plains of Africa three and a half million years ago and you hear a rustle in the grass. Is it a dangerous predator or is it just the wind? Well, if you think it's a dangerous predator and it turns out it's just a win, you've made a type 1 error, a false positive, you've connected A to B, but A is not really connected to B. You made a mistake in thinking, but that's a low-cost error to make. No harm. You're just more skittish and careful and cautious and vigilant, and you move around the, the, the weird noise, and, and that's pretty much the end of that. And we've all seen on the fur, fin, and feather shows what animals are like out in the wild. They're fairly skittish, especially preyed upon animals. On the other hand, if you think the rustle in the grass is just the wind and it turns out it's a dangerous predator, your lunch. Congratulations, you've been given a Darwin Award for taking yourself out of the gene pool without reproducing. So in other words, I'm arguing that there was a natural selection for uh, making one kind of error versus another kind of error. Type 1 error is fairly low cost, type 2 errors are high cost. So using an evolutionary theory model based uh, uh, called Hamilton's Rule, basically why would we be nice to other people uh, that are not our twins or our immediate offspring, uh, there's a whole series of formulas for how much energy you put into a system, how much risk you take, and so on, versus what the uh, benefits are, cost-benefit ratio. So I show in the book the formula of how this works and why we would uh, tend to be, have, selected, have a selection process for making one kind of error versus the other kind of error. That is, the rule of thumb is just believe everything you hear and see just in case it's real because there's no time, well, okay, so why, why can't we get it right? Why can't we just sit there in the grass collecting more data to see if it's a dangerous predator or just the wind? And the answer is because that will also get you uh, taken out and, and eaten for lunch. That is, sitting there collecting more data is itself a costly, risky process. So it's much better to make snap, intuitive, rapid decisions uh, based on minimal data because there's no time to collect more data. So our brains have all this capacity or this propensity to just make really fast decisions. And that's what all the research in cognitive psychology, behavioral economics, and so on. The, the enlightenment vision of humans as rational calculators, maximizing our utility and, and our happiness, and, and making, making these rational choices through free will is, is an illusion. None of that is true. That isn't how we do it. We stand there in front of the toothpaste section in the supermarket, and we just grab the, the one because it's blue or whatever. We recognize the logo. We don't sit there and analyze the ingredients and so on. And all our decisions are made that way, from toothpaste to spouses to jobs and careers and, and, and houses and so on. We rarely do rational calculations. And so the, this, the reason pe people believe weird things is because we have to make rapid cognitions about believing all sorts of things. The rule of thumb is just believe pretty much everything. And this is why everybody, including skeptics and scientists, tend to fall into the trap of just believing things because that's what we heard or we were raised that way or so on. The difference is, of course, as I'll finish up um, at the end of this little talk, uh, the science has a built-in self-correcting mechanism called the scientific method with peer review and corroboration and, and checking and rechecking and, and blind and double-blind conditions and all this because scientists are no better at this than anybody else. Every scientist would love his pet theory to be true. Uh, they can advance their career much more rapidly, win prizes, gain raises, and so on, by having their particular pet theory turn out to be true. So, of course, they're going to succumb to the confirmation bias where they look for and find confirmatory evidence for what they already believe and ignore the disconfirming evidence. Everybody does it. So it's not just political ideologues and economic ideologues and religious people and so on. Everybody, all of us, every one of us has this problem. So I call this belief-dependent realism. There is a real world, but it's, our understanding of it is dependent on our beliefs. Most of our beliefs are arrived at for non-smart reasons, non-rational reasons. We were raised that way, emotional, subjective uh, elements to it. Family background, siblings, peer groups, teachers, mentors, books that we read, influence of culture, and so on. All that shapes our beliefs, and then, um, and, and then, and then we employ our cortex with our great ability to rationalize and collect all the data we need to support it. 
So that's how it works. And I have quite a bit of research uh, showing the research on this, how it's related to the levels of uncertainty in the environment. The more uncertain the environment is, the more anxious you are in a particular situation, the more likely you are to fall into these traps of disbelieving things, finding patterns. I call that patternicity, the tendency to find meaningful patterns in random noise. By the way, those of you who've asked me, why, do you, why did you create a new name? Why not just use pareidolia? Because I can hardly pronounce pareidolia anyway. And, uh, and that isn't what I mean. I, I don't mean the process of just seeing the face of Jesus in a tortilla or the Virgin Mary on the side of a building or grilled cheese sandwich. I mean all kinds of patterns and that we have to find patterns and learn and connect the dots. That's what we do. That's what I'm really talking about with patternicity, all sorts of patterns. And that the more uncertain the environment is, the more likely you are to see patterns. It seems to happen more in the right hemisphere than the left hemisphere. There's a whole body of research on these different things. Dopamine appears to be related to it. The more uh, um, input from dopamine you get through experiments by giving subjects L-dopa, for example, they're more likely to see pa uh, illusory patterns that aren't there. So we're kind of starting to hone down on where in the brain this happens, why it happens, what the neurochemical transmitters are related to finding these patterns, and this is all connected to how the brain works and, and how we learn. And we should be cautious not to be too critical of people that find lots of patterns. We have to be careful about this because um, although, and, and you, you know this, this classic skeptic's line, you know, keep, keep a mind open enough to see radical new ideas but not so open-minded that your brains fall out. Well. That, that is a truism because, um, and I have a whole section in that chapter on creativity and madness. See, patternicity, this isn't a bad thing. It's often a good thing. Seeing new patterns that no one else has ever seen, that is the basis of creativity and genius. This is how you discover, make a new discovery in science or create a new genre in music or a, a new style in art. Uh, the problem is, is that if your brain is kind of wired up to be super creative and see patterns all over the place, maybe you also see patterns that aren't real. And so my favorite example that I use in the book is, that, uh, say, the difference between uh, Richard Feynman and, and John Nash. Feynman wins the Nobel Prize in physics for uh, his discovery of these um, uh, uh, components to quantum electrodynamics. And, uh, Feynman diagrams where he sees a vision in his head of how these subatomic particles interact and he, and he sketches them out and he put them on the side of his van, which you can still see if you ever get to Southern California, I'll take you to see it. Uh, his van with the famous Feynman diagrams on the side. And this, as the story goes, he was driving up Lake Boulevard there from, uh, from Pasadena up to Altadena where I, where I live and he lived. And uh, with big Feynman diagrams on the side of his van, and somebody rolls down the window at the stop sign and says, how come you have Feynman diagrams on your van? And he said, because I'm Feynman. Which, uh, <laughs> which I thought that'd be really cool to be able to say that. <laughs> and then by contrast, John Nash won the Nobel Prize in economics for his discovery of the mathematical relationships of subjects in games. So game theory, prisoner's dilemma, ultimatum games, these sorts of things. There's, something called Nash Equilibrium, of how uh, subject con contestants in a, a contest, a game, whether it's so something like Prisoner's Dilemma or whether it's nations in a, a Cold War state or, or anything like that, people in relationships, business contracts and whatnot, uh, they reach this Nash Equilibrium. Anyway, that's not important. What's important is that John Nash uh, was also seeing patterns that no one else saw. And, uh, and if you see enough weird patterns, it's actually called schizophrenia. And you remember, he's the subject of a beautiful mind. And he described in the book, anyway, uh, when asked, why is it you, you think aliens are talking to you and there's secret government agents that talk to you? And he said, because it's the same source I get for my mathematics of understanding game theory. In other words, there's, there's no discriminatory tool in the brain to tell the difference between these patterns over here that turn out to be real, so important you win a Nobel Prize for it, and these patterns over here that are just madness. So there is a fine line between creativity and madness. And now there's an extensive database. Um, Nancy Andreessen, University of Iowa, is probably the best source for this. Uh, that uh, Her database, anyway, these are all super creative people, people that have won prizes in their fields and, and so on. And she brings them to the university and scans their brains and so on. A significant percentage of them have uh, different degrees of mental illness, either a manic depression or schizophrenia, or either them or their immediate family members. So there's something genetically programming the brain to see lots of patterns. On the one hand, this is good. On the other hand, it may not be so good. So right, it's, it's the, the rub is finding the balance there. 
Okay, back to our thought experiment. Hominid on the plains of Africa three and a half million years ago, Russell in the grass, dangerous predator. Uh, is, is it a dangerous predator or just the wind? What's the difference between the wind and a dangerous predator? The wind is an inanimate object. Dangerous predator is uh, an intentional agent. The difference between being an inanimate force and an intentional agent is what I call agenticity, the tendency to infuse these patterns with intentional agents that operate secretly, invisibly, controlling the world, running things, whether these are gods and ghosts and spirits and demons and angels or conspiracies, our brains also tend to, uh, because we're natural born dualists, tend to think that there's two things, corporeal and incorporeal, body and soul, brain and mind. And I have a little pet peeve in the book about quit using mind words. It's probably the result of my recent experiences with Deepak of uh, using these mind words because... Uh, it's, it's, too, um, it's too fuzzy. It doesn't tell us anything. It, it, act, it makes us think that there's something else in mind that's besides the substrate, the brain itself. Uh, but we know that, in fact, if you destroy parts of the brain through tumors or brain injury or, or strokes or Alzheimer's, dementia, senility, as the neurons die, the brain function, the mind, whatever you want to call it, uh, dies with it. As your brain dies, your memories die. Where do they go? without the brain. This was my contention with Deepak. Where is Aunt Millie's mind when her brain goes from Alzheimer's? And by God, he had an answer. You want to know what it was? The Matrix. <laughs> the Matrix. I said, great. Where do I get that other than Netflix? <laughs> without the substrate, there is no, there's no mind, right? So. But nevertheless, we tend to think that there's a dualistic force, an essence that continues on. All the good research on this by Bruce Hood and, and uh, Paul Bloom at Yale and others that, uh, for example, if you, if you ask subjects, would you wear Hitler's sweater, almost everybody goes, oh, no, no, because it's like infused with evilness, like evil is a thing, a substance, uh, that, that it really exists outside of people. Or, but would you wear Mr. Rogers' cardigan sweater? Oh, yes, it would feel so warm and make me feel moral and upstanding. And um, w one of these guys put up uh, Brad Pitt's sweater on eBay for sale, washed or unwashed. Which one do you think got the most uh, money? Yeah, of course, everybody wants the essence of Brad Pittness or whatever that would be. <laughs> now there may be evolutionary reasons for this. Scent has, has, a, has good and bad properties to it. The, 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 the sense of disgust the things that, we, that, that smell really bad and make us have a, an emotion of disgust usually tend to be things related to body, bodily excrements and uh, communicable diseases, things like that that we probably shouldn't get too close to. Uh, because in our evolutionary history, they probably did cause widespread disease, something like that. So there's a good reason why we have a repulsion for things that are bad, especially if they smell bad or related to that. Uh, versus some, something like uh, the scent of your lover or somebody you love or some good smells like flowers or roses or whatever. These bring on good, a good sense of, uh, of, a, of a positive emotion. And so that would be, then maybe be connected in this essentialistic way to uh, good, good behavior, moral, uh, moral behavior and that sort of thing. Anyway, I have a long discussion about that. But the problem is that the, the process is that we then naturally tend to believe in invisible agents. So... Uh, I, so then I have chapters on God and the afterlife. These are obviously elements of that. So although, yes, of course, I can't prove there's no God, I think I build a pretty good case to show that there's lots of positive evidence to show that we create gods in our brains and exactly how this happens and where it happens in the brain. It's not one place. God's too com complex of, a, of an idea to happen in just one little spot. Uh, but I show how this whole essentialism, dualism, this agenticity, and all this stuff sort of... Uh, combines into different parts of the brain to gel into this idea of a god. Not, not just Yahweh God, but any god, invisible gods, lots of gods, polytheistic gods, animistic gods, spirits of any kind, demons, angels, and so forth. Um, and then you can just take that from brain, neuroscience, behavior genetics, about 50% of pretty much everything we believe is heritable. Uh, that is, identical twins separated from birth, raised in separate environments, still have remarkable similarities and not just the way they dress and, and food preferences and things like that, but political beliefs, their economic and social attitudes, uh, their religious faith, uh, they're very, very parallel. These are lines of evidence showing that 
uh, that we created God in religions, not vice versa. And then, of course, culturally, socially, historically, geographically, you can show um, in a very positive way, amounting lots of evidence against the God hypothesis that uh, the number one predictor of what your religious faith is is where you happen to have been born. If you happen to have been born in India in the 20th century, you're likely to be Hindu. If you're born in America, you're likely to be Christian. Of course, there's exceptions, but statistically, that's the way it goes. So that alone tells us, not to mention all the uh, common elements of, of all the different pre-Christian religions that had uh, virgin birth elements to their story, resurrection uh, elements, and so forth, raising the dead, performing miracles. These are all quite common. So I document all those and show that it would be very unlikely. I would be shocked if it turned out there was a God. However, just in case, I have a, a little statement that I'm prepared to read. Because uh, you never know. Uh, so this is what I would say to God, uh, should it turn out that I was, I'm wrong. Anyway, <clears throat> so, uh, Lord, I did the best I could with the tools you granted me. You gave me a brain to think skeptically, and I used it accordingly. You gave me the capacity to reason, and I applied it to all claims, including that of your own existence. You gave me a moral sense, and I felt the pangs of guilt and the joys of pride for the bad and good things I chose to do. I tried to do unto others as I would have them do unto me, and although I fell far short of the ideal far too many times, I tried to apply your fundamental principle whenever I could. Whatever the nature of your immortal and infinite spiritual essence actually is, as a mortal, finite, corporeal being, I cannot possibly fathom it, despite my best efforts. And so, do with me whatever you will. And I mean it. <laughs> and then in the last third of the book, I talk about um, political and ideological uh, beliefs, because those are beliefs, too. Uh, that are, are dependent upon all, all sorts of subjective emotional components. So I won't get into all that because I've spoken here about that before. Conspiracy theories I find uh, really uh, interesting and, and a little tricky because unlike, say, the paranormal or the supernatural, conspiracies do happen. Lincoln was assassinated by a conspiracy. Franz Ferdinand uh, was assassinated by uh, Serbian um, nationalists, the, the, the Black Hand, who uh, triggered the start of World War I. Watergate was a conspiracy. There's lots of conspiracies. Uh, the, the problem is, is we tend to be um, a little too susceptible, we people in general, uh, about believing anything you hear. Therefore, every conspiracy comes, seems to be true. Like Jesse Ventura's love of anything he's ever heard must be a true conspiracy. And uh, so when I debated him on this, I, uh, you know, he was on, on about 9-11 truthism and how, uh, you know, how do you explain the, you know, the, pl the, the buildings fell, you know, all these arguments fell in their footprint in Building 7 and, he was on about the Pentagon and being hit by a missile, so I asked him a simple question, Jesse, where's the plane? If the missile hit the, hit the building and not a plane, where's the plane? Because it's gone. And like Deepak, never, never fails to have an answer, oh, they flew it to Canada and uh, whisked the subjects, uh, the, the, uh, the people, the customers off and so on. Anyway, so, uh, but if everything's a conspiracy, then nothing's a conspiracy. We have to have some way to discriminate between true. So I have a little conspiracy detector kit in the book. Here's like the 10 things you know that make it, make it unlikely that a conspiracy would be true. Like if it, if it involves world domination, you know, it's probably not true. Conspiracies tend to be very narrowly focused and so on. Although I have to say I had a recent scare about that, uh, watching that movie Too Big to Fail on HBO based on the best-selling book uh, Too Big to Fail about the financial crisis. And there's that scene uh, in the movie that's also depicted in the book quite powerfully in September of 2008 where Paulson and Bernanke uh, call in the top 10 uh, CEOs of all the major banks, Bank of America and Citibank and, and Countrywide and so on, and brings them all in a room and says, all right, guys, we control like 70% of the world's finances, and if we don't do something this weekend, we're not going to have an economy on Monday. And I thought, holy crap, it's, it's 12 guys in a room running the world, like I said, can't happen. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I have to say some of my libertarian propensities are a little bit challenged uh, about concerns for those kinds of non-transparent power sources. Do, do make me kind of nervous. Uh, in, in, this, in this case, the corporate uh, financial world, government uh, has the same problem too. So anytime you have those kinds of big forces, 
Um, that does make me think maybe some conspiracies at least have some element of truth. So we have to keep an open mind about that and always test those. So I'm going to finish up here and just read the last two paragraphs of the book about uh, why science is our best uh, hope for getting ar around this trap of belief-dependent realism. So we now come to the end of this narrative journey of belief, but it is really just the beginning of a new understanding of how the brain generates beliefs and reinforces them as truths. Of the many mysteries we have uncovered and questions we have tried to answer, one in particular stands out. Homo rationalis, that species of human who carefully weighs all decisions through cold, hard logic and rational analysis of the data, is not only extinct, but probably never existed. Mr. Spock is science fiction. And it's a good thing because people who have suffered brain damage to the emotional networks of their brains, particularly their limbic systems, find it nearly impossible to make even the simplest of decisions about the most mundane choices in life, which toothpaste to buy, for example, with so many brands and sizes and qualities and prices to consider, reason alone will leave you standing there in the store aisle, frozen in indecision, analysis paralysis. An emotional leap of faith beyond reason is often required just to get through the day, let alone make the big decisions in life. In the end, all of us are trying to make sense of the world, and nature has gifted us with a double-edged sword that cuts for and against. On one edge, our brains are the most complex and sophisticated information processing machines in the universe, capable of understanding not only the universe itself, but the process of understanding. On the other edge, by the very same process of forming beliefs about the universe and ourselves, we are also more capable than any other species of self-deception and illusion, of fooling ourselves even when we are trying to avoid being fooled by nature. In the end, I want to believe, but I also want to know. The truth is out there, and although it may be difficult to find, science is the best tool we have for uncovering it. Thank you. Thank you. Michael Schremer, ladies and gentlemen.